Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast, Season 2, Episode 11, and today we're talking about possession. <laughs> I told you I could rhyme that. I mean, it's sort of, it was close. It's a, it's a bit of a stretch, yeah. but we'll give it to you. <laughs> now, um, this is a, a, a topic that a lot of people ask questions about, usually when they have a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, some things that we do with our dogs and our young puppies to try to avoid any issues with possession, but it's a pretty natural thing. Absolutely. And I think that's something that people really need to understand is, you know, what you need to do to um, let your dog know that uh, although they have a tendency to possess items, uh, that it's it's important that they understand that to, to, that they need to be able to give something up to us. Absolutely. Absolutely. We tend to, as humans, we tend to think in a very linear fashion where things are either good or bad, right? Someone's either a criminal or not a criminal. And then there's this point where you can do some rehabilitation and make that person into a good person from the bad person that they might have been or been acting as. And we tend to apply that to our dogs as well. They either bite or they don't bite. And if they do bite, there's this big rehabilitation process. And if they don't bite, they're not a biter. And that unfortunately has really, it's way too much of a simplification for dogs. The thing is, we love dogs as dogs, and they have all these qualities that come with them. And some of those qualities are not desirable in a human world, but we don't get to pick and choose what we like. We get what we get because that's the makeup of the dog. The genetics of the creature includes a creature that is allowed to possess items. It is completely lawful in the rules of dogdom to possess items. You know, dogs will exert um, their sort of authority in a situation by saying, I am the owner of this item. Ownership is a big deal with dogs. Mm -hmm. And if you get into a situation where your dog thinks that's an okay way to continue to act in our human world, then you could lead yourself down a bad road. What we want to be able to do is teach our dogs preventatively that us taking items away from them is a good thing. We're not a threat. You know, it's not the same rules that they would need to use in dogdom. The rules are different here because we don't actually want to take what they have. We're not trying to take their valuable items. We're trying to convince them that us approaching is not a threat. So the preventative measures are things that you should do with every single dog that comes into your house. And we, got, we get this question a lot. We have um, weekly step-by-step uh, -step processes for preventing possession in our Puppy Essentials program that we help all of our students make sure that they're setting their dogs up to be really well-behaved canine citizens and not be possessive of items with the humans in the home. And when we have puppies that are not showing any signs of possession, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. But a lot of the times the students will come to us and say, well, you know what? I don't have this problem. So I do, do I still need to spend the time on this? And that is a resounding yes, 100%, because it doesn't matter if your dog is not showing signs of this now. It doesn't mean there's no guarantee that they're not going to start showing signs of possession later on down the road or when they have something that they find valuable enough to claim ownership of. You might see different behaviors come out. So it is so important to set a good, solid foundation and some groundwork with our dogs so that they clearly understand, you know what? I'm not a threat. Me taking something away from you means better things are going to happen in return. And we have all sorts of drills and games we use for that. A couple of really important points that I think we should <clears throat> double down on. Um, when you mentioned briefly that uh, that we're teaching our dogs to live in a human world, mm -hmm. that is so often overlooked. People Absolutely. just have some expectation that the, the dog should understand or uh, this sort of Disney model of what their dog might be. But a lot of our effort when we talk about training isn't to teach a dog to sit and stay. It's not to teach a dog uh, specifically to walk at our whatever left-hand side. It's about learning how to exist in a human world. Precisely. Absolutely. And the rules are so completely different than the rules for dogdom. I mean, in dogdom, they play with each other with their mouths constantly and bite. And the the dog that bites harder is the one that ends up winning the game. Like there's, there's very different rules in dogdom and we take them in and then we say, okay, you need to live by my rules, which means we need to give them a fair shake at learning those rules because they are not going to be the innate guidance that comes along with the creature. Yeah. The other thing that you talked about is uh, that you do this with any dog and uh, kind of to go along with what we're talking about when it comes to training and training doesn't mean obedience skills. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done this with adult dogs that came into our household and um, it's a great, it's an important thing to, when we teach leadership. Yes. It's an important uh, opportunity to teach your dog that putting in that little bit of effort for you is valuable. Um, so, you know, 
this could be dogs of any breed, any age. It's Absolutely. A, it's a training activity, whether you've got a brand new rescue at home or an eight-week-old puppy. You bet. The only caveat that I would make is if you start seeing things that you're not comfortable with. And um, th- some, of the, some of the signs that you might see that a dog is showing possession, you know, they might place their paw over a toy. Things like that are not are not an extreme sign of possession. They're a mild sign of possession. And that is where you want to step in with drills. You know, if you see your dog doing things like moving their body over an item when you approach or pacing with an item or hiding an item, those are signs that 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 dog might have a tendency towards possessing things that are even lower value. So let's get some drills in. Let's get some preventatives done. If you see anything that is bigger than that, you know, if you see growling, if you see whites of the dog's eyes, if you see any freezing, any snapping, those are more serious signs of possession. And those are things where that I want you to make sure that you are working with a professional. Mm -hmm. Do not try to progress with that on your own. If you're if you're not well versed in behavior and in how to work through possession issues, you could make things worse in a hurry. And you could also get yourself hurt. The dog could get hurt. You know, we 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 want you to make sure that you're not going forward with any of these things unless you are in the presence of a professional that can help you through with them. We we have nearly seven hundred and we might have more than seven hundred videos on our YouTube channel now, and not one of them talks about what to do when your dog's aggressive. Um, or, There's a or, reason or for possessive. that. <laughs> there is a reason for that. Yeah, absolutely. Because we've seen enough dogs in, in, in conversations with some of the other McCann professional dog trainers. Mm-hmm. Every single dog needs something that's just a little bit different. And we don't want to put people in a situation where, number one, they could yeah. get hurt. Number two, they're giving their dog the wrong information at the wrong time. Like These exactly. are the kinds of things that can really turn into a big big problem yeah. uh, f- for the dog existing in a human world. Yeah, absolutely. And what um, what we want to be able to do in the moment is we want to be able to read the dog and read their response. And if you're not um, if you're not well versed at reading canine body language and you interpret things differently, then you're you're going to make your problem worse potentially. So we want to make sure that we're safe and we're as productive as we can be as well. But talking about some of these the steps you can take to make your dog comfortable with the idea of uh, you know of you taking things of value from them whether it is a uh, you know an older dog that you don't see any signs of uh, possessive uh, possession possession issues or it's your brand new puppy at home where do we start yeah I start with the baby puppy and that's sort of one of the first um, one of the first sections of the article is so you've got a puppy now what one of the first things that I will do is I will leave them in their crates with um, with not so valuable chews. Uh, things like Nyla bones, things like stuffed Kongs, you know, those are things that they can have. And I, I, in most cases, you're not going to have a puppy that right away tries to possess any of those items. Be careful about going to the really high value items right away with a puppy. If they don't have learning skills in place yet, if you haven't taught an out, if you haven't started to teach them that you are approaching as a valuable thing, giving them something that's really high value right off the bat and then just working on existing with the puppy might set you up to actually create a little bit of a possession issue. So work it backwards. If I do give my puppies a bully stick, I actually hold it. Mm -hmm. And I will hold the bully stick and have the puppy on my lap. So we do a little bit of snuggling. And then in addition to that, they get this chew that they're going to get to be entertained by. So it does a couple of things. It helps my dog rehearse being calm on my lap and hanging out with me. It helps bring some value to my puppy for me because I have this great thing that they're chewing and enjoying along. And it, it, it doesn't it doesn't give me a uh, potential to rehearse possession because the puppy isn't actually possessing it. I'm possessing it and I'm allowing him to chew. So it's this, you know, good, gracious gesture there that my puppy is going to enjoy being with me because he can chew on that chewy. So that is absolutely the first thing that I do when I'm working with any any puppy. I always make sure they have some time with that. How do you know what's uh, going to be a low value uh, toy for, yeah. for a dog? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, you can start with items that are not edible, and that is usually going to be something that's a little bit lower value. And of course, we always want to be careful that the things that our puppy is ch- are chewing are not items that are going to be dangerous for them. So I wouldn't, for example, leave them with a rope toy because chances are they're going to take pieces off that and swallow it, and that can cause all sorts of other problems. So it's got to be a safe chew toy and something that my puppy is readily willing to leave and not, you know, doesn't seem super intense about if he's, you know, 
willing to go over and chew it for a bit and then willing to wander away and do something else. I know that's not something that's such a high value that he's going to really, really want to possess it. And all the while, while I'm introducing those lower value chew toys, I'm also working with the higher value chew, value chew toys with these sections where I'm possessing it, I'm holding it, etc. So there is a balance between the two things, but definitely it's important that when they're actually in the position where they can possess it, it's something that they're not really that over the moon keen on. Like I wouldn't give my dog a raw bone in that situation. Yeah. And uh, I've heard students say something like, well, you know, I don't, I don't think he has possession issues. Sometimes I'll just pick up his food and, and you know, how do I work through picking up his mm -hmm. food? And um, in my opinion, that's just being annoying. Yeah. You know, that's annoying to the dog and you're setting your dog up for a failure. That's a testing uh, opportunity. Absolutely. When we do something like work with a food bowl, how would you introduce something mm -hmm. like an exercise like that? Knowing that it's high value for the dog. Yeah, you bet. And some of those steps are in this article. So you can actually go through and if you're listening, you can go through and train your puppy with some of these steps at home. Um, so basically, we're going to start with the empty food bowl because the empty food bowl is already a valuable thing. You know, as soon as you fed your puppy a couple of meals in the food bowl, they recognize it. It's something that's going to be important in their life. And basically, they are going to value that already because it associates coming with food. So now what you can do is you can associate you being around that food bowl with food appearing. So as I'm hanging out with my dog, I might sit on the floor in the kitchen or in the living room and put the food bowl in between me and my puppy. And as he investigates it, I'm going to say, you're a great puppy and I'm going to toss in a couple of kibbles or maybe something a little bit more exciting. But basically what I'm doing is I'm creating the association that me being close to the food bowl is a really good thing. I'm going to let him eat those couple of kibbles. And then when he sort of stops and looks at me and goes, okay, what gives? What's next? Maybe he investigates the food bowl again. I'm going to yes and drop in a couple more. So that is a really nice way of just saying, I'm valuable. The food bowl is valuable, sure, but me approaching it is not a threat to you whatsoever. It actually means good things are going to be anticipated. Now, um, as we get closer to the high value items, you know, how how are you number one? How are you handling outside of training with these items? What are you doing with high value items so that your puppy does that they do remain valuable? Yeah, you bet. So with the high value items, when I start, I start with the puppy in my lap, and then once I've um, once I've gotten maybe a couple of weeks into my life with this new puppy, I've always had an out command taught by the two week mark without question with any of my puppies. Those of you who've had puppies lately, you know that they are just absolute hoovers. They pick up anything and everything. And I like to tell my students as well, if you're if you spend a lot of time wrestling things out of your dog's mouth, you're actually giving them deposits in the possession bank. So they're getting to practice holding on to that item and trying. And you might be able to get away with that when they're eight and a half weeks old because they're not strong enough to keep you out of their mouth. But that is not going to last you a very long time. So one of the first skills I teach my dogs, out and leave it. Those are two really early on skills that I teach my puppies. We do really heavy duty management to make sure that we keep our puppies out of trouble. So, you know, when I can't supervise, my puppies are in the crate. When they come out, I make sure that things are tidy and clean. There's not a whole bunch of debris on the floor for them to get into trouble with. So I set the scene up as much as possible for success, minimize all the things that my puppy's going to pick up in those first couple of weeks while I'm teaching the out. And usually by day two, I've got, they've got a good idea what out means. I say out and they'll start trying to spit what they've got because they know something better is coming. So it's a really quick process to teach the out if you get on it right away, which is really nice. What about those puppies who are so wildly food motivated that people say, as soon as I bring out the treats, my dog doesn't care about toys. Yeah. This is still an exercise you want to work on with those puppies. Absolutely. And that is a nice problem to have. Having a food motivated puppy makes your life really, really easy. You just have to be a little bit strategic about the way you're working things. So if you're only, if you're only able to get one trade repetition with a toy using food, well, maybe you can use another toy. You know, rather than using food, which is higher value, if I have two toys that are fairly similar or identical, my puppy is playing with one toy, and, and we're talking about using a trade system to teach the out command, which is how we do things. In the early days, we will say out and then offer the trade so that they spit what they've got, and lots of rewards come. And through good timing, they'll start to anticipate on the out when you say out as you delay that, um, that trade offering, and then it just picks up as this really, really great command. So... What we want to make sure that we're doing is that we're getting in enough repetitions and we can use other means to do that. So if I'm playing tug with my dog and I have a similar toy, I can say out 
and then offer him the other toy as a trade. All the while, I'm going to hold the toy that I want him to drop completely still. It is no longer the action. It is no longer any fun. The only fun is going to come from the other toy. So I can say my out, offer the toy, wiggle it around. When my puppy goes to latch onto that one, I've had a successful out. And then I can build on that too. If you've got a tugging puppy, if you've got a, a, a pup that really likes to play with toys, it's so easy to build value for the out because out gives you an opportunity to play again. So if I'm having a little tug with my puppy and I say out and the toy goes completely still, even without offering a trade, most puppies, after a few seconds, they're going to drop that toy because there's nothing exciting. And then right away, you can mark with yes, bring motion to that toy again, and they get the reward. So the reward for letting go of the toy is the opportunity to play again. The reward for not letting go of the toy is just holding on to a dead toy and not getting to engage or interact or have the fun that you were just having. So. Maybe one of the most important things when we're talking about teaching your dog to drop or, or, or out on command has got to be keeping that toy still, making it disinteresting. And it's for sure one of the things that people struggle with the most. They, yeah. they just don't know. You know, they've got that tension on the toy and the puppy's still really leaning yeah. into it because they love it. But um, I can't emphasize enough how important that is. I had a uh, have a wild uh, t- toy crazy Labrador retriever and it was a struggle for me until I figured out how to make that toy less interesting, how I figured out to take the tension off or to um, uh, brace it on my leg so that it wasn't a game of tug yeah. anymore. And then you can get a little bit more attention. But if you're trying to compete uh, for, for uh, have a competition of value between a toy that they've already got that's pretty exciting in yeah. a treat that they might get, you know, they're not, you haven't taught them yet that they're going to get it when they drop it. You do need to make sure that you dr- dr- immediately drop the value of that toy by just making it uh, still. You bet. Slack in the toy so that it is not fun. Be careful you're not holding it way up in the air and trying to pull it out of the puppy's mouth. All that wrestling. Lots of puppies love that. Yeah. It's just a blast. And again, if you're wrestling things out of their mouths, they're practicing that possession ritual. So you want to try to get away from that as much as possible. We know that all of these exercises, we try to do them as much as we can, as, as much as uh, is reasonable when we have time, when we can fit it you know, into our, our lives and our schedule. How often would you work on an exercise like this? Yeah, I actually will. T- I, I'll try to get on average three to five repetitions of things like this in, in a week. And when I say repetitions, I mean training sessions. Um, I try not to harass the puppy. So for example, as you're working through some of these drills, we were talking about the food bowl, talking about throwing a couple couple of kibbles into the food bowl and letting them eat. Those ones you can do through their whole meal. But if you're at the point where, you know, now you've built more value with a little bit of a bigger handful of of kibble, now you've built more value by approaching with something that is extra special, like a big hunk of cheese as your dog is eating their kibble so you can drop that into the bowl. Those are all things that will add value, but to some some dogs and some puppies, they will also add anxiety. So we want to temper it as much as possible. If I have a dog that I'm working with that, you know, maybe a little bit softer or a little bit um, more inclined to be worried about situations, I don't want to overtax that dog. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that I'm getting in enough repetitions, but they're only beneficial to me if I'm not overwhelming the dog. And we talked about flooding last week in the episode. And I think that is such an important thing to always keep in mind with your dog. You're only benefiting from something if it's within the ability for your dog to be successful with that. If you are, for example, when we talk about exposure and socialization, if you go to the park and you're exposing your dog to other dogs by allowing them to observe from a distance, but they're giving you negative behavior from that, like barking at those other dogs, that is not a good repetition. That does not add to your training bank. It rehearses things you don't want. So, My point going back to the food bowl and possession is if you have a dog that starts to get a little bit anxious as you approach, you're you're best with a less is more approach on that one. So make sure that they are in a space where they're completely safe so they can eat and enjoy their meals when you when you know you're not interacting with them, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe go in once, maybe go in twice with something really special and then leave them be. So gauge your dog. If you've got a puppy that's like, oh, yeah, if you've got a little lab puppy that dives into the food bowl and they're going to town with it, and when you approach with a hunk of cheese or bacon, they're 
they're just like wiggling with their whole body. You can do it 25,000 times. Yes, you you yeah, won't get in enough time yeah, for that yeah. with the lab eating their food, but you can. <laughs> but if you have anything that's a little bit different, just just watch their body language, make sure they're still comfortable. So, um, and you did at the top of the show, we talked a little bit about some of those symptoms or some of the um, uh, signals that your dog is going to give you. Um, what are some things you should avoid with this kind of training? Yeah, well, that what we were just talking about, definitely avoid overtaxing the dog. Um, some of the things that are sort of uh, commonly talked about ways of dealing with possession, that attitude that, you know, I'm in charge, I can do what I want, I bought that food, therefore I'm going to take it away from you, you know, it, that's a very human way of thinking. Dogs don't think that way. And if they disagree with you, you're going to have a conflict on your hands that could be a dangerous situation. So we don't ever take the I'm in charge so I can take what I want attitude until we have earned it by putting in the training time. Yeah. So if I've done all these repetitions where I'm working on approach and adding value, where I'm working on being close to my dog and adding value to that, you know, the the um, the second step that I take with my puppies is to have them laying down with the chew toy, with the extra high value chew toy as I'm sitting beside them. And then I'll just occasionally throw a chunk of cheese you know, so they're on leash, they're there with me, so they have to stick around, and I'm just going to toss a chunk of cheese towards my dog. And that's the point where I'm going to start to reach in, take the stick, give him the piece of cheese, and then give him back the stick so it's a really win-win situation. At that point, I can start thinking, you know what? I'm in charge. I can take this if I want because I've done the work and my dog is agreeing with me, but I don't want to create the scenario where it's a fight. I need to put in the effort and teach him that I'm not a threat. When people say like, I can't believe you're, how quickly your, your dogs listen to you. You know, you're obviously a dog trainer. I think what dog trainers understand is the importance of these exercises. They also yeah. understand a balance between working on an exercise like this and hovering. And you yes. talk a little bit about hovering in your article. I think we should probably uh, highlight that. Yeah. And that's one of the, it, it's sort of the, I'm, I am I can hang out here because I want to prove that you're safe, even though you're uncomfortable with it. And we see this a lot where people aren't sure what to do. So they just keep saying, oh, you're okay. You're a good dog. And they keep petting, even though the dog is tense and growling and it clearly saying, you know, back off, I'm not comfortable with this. And I'm not in any way suggesting that it is okay for the dog to say, I'm not comfortable, back sure. off. We need yeah. to work through that, but we can't ever, we can't ever try to in part our our will on the dog by by hovering and trying to trying to pet them out of it trying to comfort them through it that is not what they need dogs don't dogs won't respond to those sorts of emotions in that situation it's a, this is mine and you need to back off so we need to change the emotional state we need to make them comfortable with the situation and we may need to make them understand that us approaching is a good thing which means that you need to work with purpose when you're doing your approach and retreat we don't want we don't want to walk in and hover and then then drop a hunk of cheese because that might bring our dog to a point where they're first resentful or anxious and then they get the cheese and it kind of there, there's always going to be arguments about this in in uh, in dogdom and in dog training about what you're rewarding when you reward an emotional state but we know for certain that we want to try our best to avoid uh, rewarding the wrong emotional state so yeah. i don't want to feed my dog if he's feeling anxious about something i want to feed him as a means of him feeling excited about something. So I need to be careful with the with the whole hovering thing. I need to move in, work with purpose, drop my treat, move out so that it's not a situation where they start to get anxious and then get a reward from that. What are some exercises that you think would, if, if someone is working on um, these kinds of issues, what other things uh, would you suggest as a dog trainer, you know, w w that would be beneficial for these new puppy owners yeah. uh, and for people with young dogs in training for listeners that might be working? What, what other things should they be doing alongside these exercises? Yeah, obedience skills. I, I mean, it, there's very specific drills that you can work for possession. There always are. And there's wonderful drills that you can work for preventative possession. But the best thing that you can do with your dog is help them learn how to learn. And this is what we see with dogs. We see when puppies come in and they learn from the get-go how to actually learn, like what the learning systems are, how to follow a lure, how to guess with shaping games, things like that. Those dogs 
they love learning and they're keen to learn. So they're looking for opportunity to earn reward from you. They're looking for opportunity to build value in their own lives. And that's what obedience training does for us. It gives us the opportunity to give them all sorts of skills, but it also gives us the opportunity to give them the ability to learn so that we can keep teaching. And uh, I mean, right on cue, uh, I should mention that if you are, no matter where you are in the world, um, we have a puppy essentials program where we talk a lot and, and actually we've just been adding new content. Uh, I know maybe you've seen us on our YouTube channel. We publish lots of videos there. That is scratching the surface of the kinds of things that you need to really be able to quickly affect change in your dog training to give your dog the best information possible. And we have a puppy essentials program. I'll list a link in the show notes below, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, I'll put it in the description. But uh, for puppies that are five months in younger, to be able to hit the ground running, to be able to teach your puppy how to learn faster, uh, I would definitely suggest checking that out. You can uh, click the link. And uh, we also have a life skills program for dogs that are over five months. Now, Shannon, um, was there anything that you think would be uh, uh, good to, to wrap up the idea of possession? Was there any sort of things left in your mind that our listeners should know about? Yeah, I actually, I would like to end it with the line that I ended the blog post with because I think it really, really says it best. Always remember that the best advice for possession is preventative and the best result from that advice is the possession that you never see. So you always need to work these exercises really? with your dogs. You yeah, bet. absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and um, I mean, I don't know how to eloquently uh, uh, end a, a podcast after something like that, but I think to really take uh, home that advice, this is much like any other skill that we're working on in dog training, where we want to avoid having these challenges because it's so much easier uh, uh, at that at that point. It's also great for relationship, great for learning. And uh, that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to take the uh, most streamlined path to success with our dogs and possession um, possession issues is no different. You bet. Really great. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us here in our episode 11. We're talking about possession. I wanted to get that rhyme in there one more time. <laughs> Now, uh, make sure if this is your first time checking out our podcast, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button. We publish new episodes every week talk, talking about uh, how dogs think, how dogs learn, and uh, giving you some of the tips that will help you to be successful more quickly in your training. And with that note, I want to thank you guys for listening. Happy training. Bye for now. Bye, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the McCann Dogs podcast. And if you'd like some more training resources, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at McCann Dogs. And if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program, where we know in just a few weeks, your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training.